I um, move the uh, I, I move and pass the floor to our panelists. I would like to welcome our uh, keynote speakers, uh, and they will do the welcoming remarks. Uh, first of all, it is my great honor to introduce uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Republic of Azerbaijan, a person who has himself worked for many years in multilateral institutions. He knows the system from inside. His Excellency uh, Ambassador Elmar Mamedyarov for welcome remarks. Mr. Minister, the floor is yours. Th thank you very much. Thank you very much, Faris. Uh, I will not call my statement as a key not uh, statement. I think that there will be much more important pan panelists as well here. And uh, I will just uh, bring a few words uh, regarding to the very, uh, very important uh, topic uh, when we're talking about uh, multilateralism and uh, diplomacy for peace. First of all, of course, I'm very glad uh, to announce that the April 24th is announced as an international day for multilateralism and uh, diplomacy for peace. So in that case, I think that it's it's very important element that will celebrate uh, this uh, 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 this uh, issue uh, as a whole. And I agree with uh, what Faris said and University for Peace, whenever you put that strengthening as an adjective in front of multilateralism, because it is uh, really need uh, to understand uh, what's going on in international affairs through the latest uh, decade or more. Uh, in reality, of course, the world has been changed. Uh, Fadis just mentioned that I used to be uh, a young diplomat in the United Nations in, 19, uh, in the beginning of the 90s. And uh, the, the Security Council uh, at that time, or still uh, the major body for maintaining of international peace and security, uh, working quite successfully, including uh, on all uh, issues uh, which uh, created a concern uh, for the world affairs. Uh, there was, uh, if you see into the statistics, through the 90s, uh, Security Council adopted uh, almost the same uh, operations for peacekeeping and peace building as they did uh, starting from the uh, 1945 up to the 90s when uh, there was absolutely different uh, configuration of international, uh, uh, of international affairs. Uh, and it is showing up that it is possible that the Security Council, including first and at most uh, P5, can work together and at most important at that time when the uh, United States and Russia uh, work in, uh, together addressing uh, the issues of international concern. And then I can compare to the uh, 2000, beginning of 2010, or particularly 2012, 12 and 13, yeah, we was, uh, as a non-permanent members of Security Council, we was very happy when we win after the seven battle round of, uh, to be a mem non-permanent member of Security Council. Uh, that's absolutely dif different atmosphere uh, in the Security Council. I remember, again, in the 90s, uh, people coming uh, out from the meetings, uh, uh, particularly the representative of uh, the, those embassies who was uh, members, non permanent and non-permanent, and share uh, what was discussed behind the closed doors. In the, uh, in the years when Azerbaijan was a non-permanent member, uh, that was absolutely different atmosphere, and particular. Uh, I, I, we have a joke during the uh, Soviet time that when the one of the uh, one of the, the Communist Party member coming to the uh, his boss party function and I say, "Do I have a right to do it?" and they say, "Yes, you have the right." I say, "Can I do it?" They say, "No, you can't." <laughs> it's almost the same with the Security Council, honestly speaking. Whenever you can speak, okay, you can speak. Whenever you come to the paper and start working, for example, on the draft, they say, "No way, P5 has decided everything," instead of you. But this is the reality. Yeah, and, and unfortunately, what we see when we're talking about multilateralism is uh, that uh, it's built it up uh, that uh, what the world is facing, including all uh, these uh, conflict resolutions, uh, when we're talking about the hotspots all around the world, and the end of the story, uh, Security Council cannot produce even one single resolution. Uh, even if we'll touch upon the humanitarian touch, uh, well, side, it's still, again, the difficulties. Uh, of course, then it comes uh, the question of what we have to do. I believe that uh, uh, this, is, this is the issue which we have to address because the world has been changed dramatically. I 
not only I, but we strongly believe in Azerbaijan, that the future for the countries and for the international relations is first and utmost uh, that uh, the, uh, the small countries or mid-sized countries will be much more united. This is not occasion that, that Azerbaijan decided to put forward its initiative for the next summit of non-aligned movement. And in this case, of course, the voice of the countries uh, who are, it not depends on size, as we say. It it's, uh, depends on uh, how we can unite our voices that, uh, to address the issues of, uh, of the concerns. Number two, I believe that we have to address also through the latest developments, like there's no doubt that the, this century will be under the pressure of uh, digital information and digitalization of uh, the including uh, of uh, the international relations. I think that uh, the phenomena of Internet, uh, Facebook, uh, Instagram, and so on and so far, or in, in general when we're talking about the digital uh, digitalization of uh, everyday life, uh, of every person, it for sure will get an impact on, uh, on, on the international relations. Uh, and I think that uh, if uh, one will follow it, uh, we have to address this phenomenon more thoroughly. Uh, through the, uh, not only just addressing through the uh, personal countries approach, but on the international, uh, through the international uh, arena, through the international approach, including of a very important way to discuss within the United Nations. And I think that United Nations already uh, tried to do some, uh, some steps in this regard. I think that uh, this is a reality for which, uh, well, to which we have to address. And then we come to diplomacy for peace. Nothing is better for peace. I think that uh, peace, is providing, uh, uh, peace is providing stability and peace is providing sustainability. And uh, the, this agenda, which is approved for uh, 2030 of sustainable development, which approved by United Nations, we need the multilateralism. I, I, I think, that, I think that we have to strengthen it around it, because we have to address when we're talking about the conflict, honestly speaking, just a few words regarding, as a person who directly involved in negotiations with our immediate neighbor Armenia uh, with regard to the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict and its settlement, uh, we are not shy enough to say uh, pretty publicly, and me personally, when we're asking that we always have this conflict for 30 years. And talking to uh, not only my Armenian counterpart, but even trying to find out the way talking to the ordinary citizens of Armenia, uh, we are saying, what Armenia gain? Just give us the one argument. What Armenia gain from the conflict with Azerbaijan over Nagorno-Karabakh through the last 30 years? And the answer is pretty evident. Conflict cannot bring you any positive or any sustainable development or any stability. In, for example, in case of Armenia, it's uh, uh, around 40 or beyond 40 percent of poverty. Uh, there's a huge migration uh, and immigration because people do not believe, people do not believe in the, the future of the country. And that's why the most smart is probably leaving the country. And then, for example, in case of Armenia, uh, from time to time, once I talk to the uh, uh, in the, my famous interview to Armenian journalists in the airplane, and I asked her that, she said, but diaspora is going to help us. And I said, just look, give me any one uh, re example, except of my former colleague Vardana Skanyan, foreign minister of uh, Armenia, uh, any of member of diaspora who have decided to return back to Armenia because he believes into the independence and prosperity in this country. No one. And it's because they do not believe in the future of the country. And uh, diaspora from time to time can spend some money for that, but you cannot uh, build up sustainable economy based on the diaspora uh, transfers. And, uh, and I think that uh, talking about diplomacy for peace, I think that what the messages must be done very clearly. We're talking about, for example, just I mentioned non Align movement. There is a Bandung principles. It's Bandung principles on which the 120 countries members of non aligned movement are totally shared. And I think that based on this, when we recognize that the importance of uh, international respect for international recognized borders, 
uh, with importance that you cannot change international recognized borders by use of force. And in that case, I think that this is it's a must for the uh, for the building up a normal uh, life within the international affairs which is exist today. This is, of course, one of the tasks which stand in front of diplomacy. And diplomacy must uh, probably triple its efforts to continue work in this regard that uh, if we are ready following, and we should not agree with that, following to some uh, ill-prepared ideas that the borders can be changed by use of force without the aspirations of the people, or in case, for example, of Azerbaijan, uh, when they say yes, we ethnically cleanse the territory and now say, now we introduce the idea of self-determination. It's impossible. Those people who used to live there, even if we're taking uh, the, one of the principles of self-determination, must, of course, take the, into consideration the position of those who used to live there of different nation, of different nationalities. And I think that, I think that uh, more strong we will be in this regard, more uh, strong we will be send the message as, uh, as the countries who are interested and recognize uh, that uh, this is uh, the ideas which was enshrined into the UN Charter, it is enshrined in the Helsinki Final Act, it is after the 1945, was part of, well, let's say, it's code of the, of the game uh, for the international affairs, and I think that more stronger we will send this message, uh, it will be uh, to the whole world, it will be better for all of us. Yes, we understand, in the 90s there was uh, changing parameters because there was a Cold War, there was, uh, let's say, bipolar world, now they was introducing that one polar world which does not fly, which does not work, and uh, now there was an intention to introduce again bipolar world, and, uh, and I think that we will again uh, will get more troubles which we're facing today when we're talking about uh, the peace aspirations and conflict resolutions all around the world. So I think that uh, I will stop here and uh, invite the other panelists to, to talk about it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Minister. You have provided very detailed information about Azerbaijan's experience with UN Security Council as a non-permanent member. And uh, thank you for your also examples for uh, around the world. Um, we have a few other people who have uh, honored us with their welcome remarks, and I would like to introduce uh, Madam Ms. Nada Al-Nashif, Assistant Director General for Social and Human Sciences at UNESCO. UNESCO is doing a lot around the world to promote peace and uh, cultural understanding. It would be uh, great to hear your perspective as well, Ms. Al-Nashif. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, hard to be original as we come to the end of, of the second day almost, but I'm thrilled to be here and I, I think it's, this is an important discussion and uh, I wish to start by also thanking the government of Azerbaijan for its leadership, starting with President Aliyev's statement yesterday and this absolute commitment to multilateralism, which is critical. Um, UNESCO has also long supported the UN-mandated University of Peace, and I, I think it's great to be here. I'm a member of the Council, and this is my inaugural appearance for them. So um, the objectives align very closely. We have a shared belief in the importance of knowledge and education for creating and sustaining peace. This shared uh, vision continues to resonate strongly, of course, many years after it was articulated, despite a very different set of challenges that we face. We have a more complex and more global set of threats to peace, I think, than in 1945, when UNESCO and much of the UN system was founded. We have uh, a lot of growth in social and ec in economic inequalities. Um, and phenomena like climate change, of course, which continue to put pressure on access to vital resources. New forces of division are emerging. We are facing hatred, intolerance, ignorance, violent extremism, as we've all said, all attacking social fabric in very fundamental ways. We have the largest refugee and displacement crisis of recent history. Um, at a time when cultural diversity, the principles of coexistence uh, are really under a very significant threat uh, from the pressures of excessive populism, nationalisms, nativism even, as we are calling it now. And new technologies with the potential to better connect individuals uh, and communities are also being misused, misdirected, I think, to sow the seeds of division and misunderstanding. And 
at the same time, I think we have a good sense of what some solutions are. We, we know that since no one person, organization, or state uh, can solve these problems on their own, uh, and these are intractable issues, then we need to forge common responses, and we need multilateral cooperation and dialogue. This is the only way forward. And we know also that multilateralism, and His Excellency the Minister has given some examples, must be more than the sum of interests. It must be more than just bilateral relationships multiplied or exaggerated. It must be a dialogue of the parties willing to listen. It must be a process of collective intelligence in action where voices can be understood and heard, uh, not just listened to, heard, uh, and where compromises are in an integral part of the outcomes. I think this is the role of institutions like UNESCO, uh, which have promoted peace holistically and continue to do so in the spirit of constructive and inclusive multilateralism. And I believe we do that through the advocacy of the fundamental rights in our domain, uh, the right to education, the right to cultural diversity, the right to benefit from science, and the right to freedom of expression among a few. Um, and this is why we are here. This is why the Baku process has been such uh, a synergy uh, with the thinking of, of UNESCO, I think, um, in order that we can really understand the challenges. For more than 70 years, peace has been at the core of the United Nations system mandate. It's been a driving force behind all the actions that we have undertaken, um, constructing peace. Uh, the defenses of peace in the minds of women and women needs a continuous investment. Uh, this is, of course, at the heart of the vision of the Sustainable Development Goals, what we have called Agenda 2030. It's a vision which is very heavily anchored in human rights. It targets social justice, and it really aspires uh, to a, a view of human dignity um, which the Secretary General uh, has used to prioritize prevention above all, I think, uh, particularly in the reform of the UN peace architecture. And, and it goes hopefully beyond the Security Council, which we all know is a, is a work in progress. Um, we need to understand partnerships better. Uh, last year, we had the pleasure to launch the UNESCO publication, The Long Walk of Peace Towards a Culture of Prevention. Ambassador David uh, was with us at that time. Uh, a critical reflection on the evolution of the concept of peace and the need for more collaborative action, designed together, not just combined, uh, to sustain peace in this contemporary world. But we managed to show how 32 UN entities have nurtured peace uh, in an interconnected way. We drew a broad canvas uh, which showed, along with the imperatives of human rights and development, um, how the focus on education for peace, global citizenship, cultural diversity, and dialogue can really come together uh, in this journey of discovery. And I, I think that's the key message. I will end with a quotation from the Secretary General. Um, as we look to the challenges we face, from climate change to migration to terrorism to the downsides of globalization, there is no doubt in my mind that global challenges require global solutions. No country can do it alone. We need today multilateralism more than ever. Thank you for joining us in this call. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam al Nashif, for this perspective from UNESCO. I just realized that when I was leaving uh, my office in the morning, I grabbed a notebook, and it ha happens to be the notebook of ADA Model United Nations, which <laughs> our students are uh, playing and s participating in simulations. This is the best way, really, to Sorry, build really. to build the trust in UN system, in multilateral system, to teach young people about the benefits of the multilateral system, and and our students are very active in this Model United Nations. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have heard from a minister, from representative of international organization, and now we uh, would like to hear from an educational institution. It is my great honor to introduce rector of University of, for Peace, uh, Professor Francisco Aravena, our partner. Uh, Professor, the floor is yours. Let me excuse, as a professor, I prefer to speak stand-up. Vice Rector, Ambassadors, Authorities of Azerbaijan, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to thank 
the government of the Republic of Azerbaijan and His Excellency Ambassador Amar Madajarov, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Azerbaijan, for organizing this important meeting. My congratulations to Nada and Lasif, Assistant Director for Social for Social and Human Science of UNESCO, a member of our University Peace Council, for her participation. We are immensely pleased to co-organize with other universities this roundtable on multilateralism and diplomacy for peace. At the University for Peace, multilateralism and multiculturalism this is part of our daily reality as a work determined to educate future leaders for peace. The University for Peace was established through an international agreement adopted by the General Assembly of the United Nations through the Resolution 3555 of 5 of December 1980. We have just 40 years. The University was created the express purpose to provide humanity with an international institution of higher education for peace with the aim to promoting among all human beings the spirit of understanding, tolerance, and peaceful coexistence, to stimulate cooperation among people, and to help lessen obstacles and threat to the world peace and progress in keeping with the notable aspiration proclaimed by the Charter of the United Nations. Currently, 41 countries are signing the UPS Charter. The UPS is a global institution with operation in Latin America, Europe, Africa, and Asia. We are also incredibly satisfied and having just renewed our memorandum of understanding with the government of Azerbaijan in promoting cooperation for peace. The global context, geostrategic relation and global geopolitics has been reconfigured. Currently, strategic global restructuring is characterized by uncertainties. New bands in power relation between the main actor has not been, gene, been achieved. One of the consequences of this profound change is the significant crisis of the multilateral system. Global threat has increased. New menaces such as climate change, international crime, fake news, and global crisis has emerged. Only cooperation will, be, will make possible to face this challenge. Without peace, right cannot be exercised. Without peace, human rights are deeply and increasingly violated. Where there, where there is no peace, there is no development or prosperity. War and crisis create more poverty, inequity, tensions, and violence. This is the importance of the SDG 16, peace, justice, and a strong institution. The construction of cooperative and effective multilateralism. Over the last 100 years, multilateralism has played a central role in the international relations and relations within the international system in general. The League of Nations emerging with the fundamental objective to institutionalize multilateralism as a vehicle toward achieving peace and security. The San Francisco Conference in 1945 put the fundament, fundamental for the new institution of multilateralism. The United Nations emerged to preserve peace, foster development, and protect human rights. The organization took on itself to deliver the war of peace of an, for the new generation. This has been achieved at the largest extent for the last three generations. It's avoid the war, the, the world war between the main global powers and limit the scope of impact of many regional wars. United Nations has made a global peace possible. The United Nations has managed to incorporate different non-governmental and civil society actors through a consultative status. A state continue to be the main actors. 
stability, security and peace and human rights continue to be a permanent task of the organization. It is from there that the importance of prevention and stressing the peace diplomacy arise. This area has demonstrated important achievement. However, world is failing in regard to environmental protection and disarmament, particularly nuclear disarmament and in human security. In other areas, it is slow. Many of these delays are now being addressed through the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. It should be noted that the change in the power relation, the process of globalization and the global interdependence, the definition of institutional legitimacy, the re-emergence of extreme nationalism and populism has established polarization that are manifested through a global and regional multilateral crisis. This leads us to emphasize and propose to move a more cooperative and effective multilateralism. This multilateralism will be characterized by being inclusive, open, legitimate, representative, responsible in its proposal and decision, and effective in it, its actions. Cooperative and effective multilateralism include different actors with the state pre preponderance. It promotes association as a way to work dialogue and consultation. It also fosters collaboration and promotes innovation. It establishes decision-making mechanisms that favor cooperation and effective action. This multilateralism builds shared common vision on global and regional threats of all types. It builds institutions practice and instruments to address challenges, disputes, and threats, especially transnational ones and those of multidimensional na nature. In short, cooperative and effective multilateralism favor the action towards diplomacy for peace, as well as policy created based on prevention, peace education, and non-violence. Basic principles refer to state sovereignty, non-intervention, respect of international law and human rights, reinforce the dialogue and the common vision and action, like the Baku process. Cooperative and effective multilateralism is an influ efficient instrument to transform conflict in a conciliation process. The General Assembly in 1980 also approved the UPs as a permanent observer status before the UN system. The university, through their five departments, International Law, Department of Peace and Conflict, Department of Environmental, Department of Regional Studies, Distant Education Program, and their doctoral program, is the way we are permit academic excellence by promoting critical analysis for conflict transformation with the spirit of understanding on and cooperation. The sign of the memorandum of understanding between Azerbaijan and the University for Peace opened new opportunities for education of the leadership for peace for creation and space for debate a major issues in the international agenda and the collaboration in the agenda of the non-alignment countries where Azerbaijan will have the leadership. These ideas and proposals will allow us to put our motto in practice. If we want peace, we must work for peace. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rector. Thank you for your insightful views and detailed analysis. Um, since this is a panel organized by two universities, we decided to open it up for questions, and Mr. Minister and other uh, panelists have ge generously agreed to answer maybe two, three questions from the audience before I move on with other members of the panel. Please, raise your hand, uh, introduce yourself if you have a question or maybe even a comment. Uh, please, gentlemen on the Right? Yes, can you please? Uh, please introduce yourself. 
Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Rasul Mehdiev. I am currently the student at Baku State University and also I am participant of Model United Nations Movement in Azerbaijan. And my question is addressed to Mr. Mamedyarov that uh, as you know there are some countries that are member of United Nations and has uh, doesn't have good relations between them and sometimes um, it causes problems uh, in the United Nations systems to solve the problem, especially in United Nations Security Council. Uh, my question is that how we can enhance the United Nations system in order to tackle this problem. Thank you very much. That's, that's a perfect question. If I know the answer to this question, probably I'll not be seated in this chair. I will be seated somewhere else, <laughs> including in New York. Uh, but realistically speaking, I think that thank you for this question. I think that you catch, uh, you catch uh, the sense uh, that the United Nations, as it is, it was established and agreed uh, mostly what we decided as a result of the World War II. And if you read initial the uh, UN Charter, uh, which was amended after that, it was based that there will be no war in the, in the world. Uh, because the Second World War was a very, very dramatic and disastrous. Uh, but unfortunately, it was initially when it was established. Uh, you remember it was uh, deal with the so difficult uh, problems like uh, Palestinian case, uh, then Israel-Palestinian case, then uh, Pakistan-India case, uh, and so on and so far. And the uh, UN Security Council uh, uh, try to intervene because all the member states of United Nations are uh, delivered the maintaining the role of uh, recognize the uh, major role of the Security Council of the United Nations for maintaining of international peace and security as it's enshrined in the UN Charter. Uh, and then uh, resolution was adopted in this regard, what including of those uh, uh, conflicts and issues which I've just mentioned uh, in the end of 40s, beginning of 50s. Uh, but unfortunately, there was uh, implemented partially. Sometimes uh, some of the uh, uh, some of them are not implemented, and uh, and so on and so far. And I think that there was a very key question always uh, within the discussion uh, regarding the reforming of uh, United Nations. There is an idea that. Uh, uh, that it should be expansion of the Security Council. Uh, of course, uh, uh, it, it's not an easy issue, it's not an easy question, and, uh, and I think that uh, uh, P5 will be strongly opposed to that because there is a, a lot of, let's be honest, at the end, because it's an open secret, uh, that uh, how they're going to be expanded, uh, who is going to be uh, part of the expanded uh, Security Council, should it be non permanent members, should it be with the veto power, should it be uh, the, the expansion of the person, pers uh, permanent members, and so on and so forth. Generally speaking, <coughs> I can say you that so far the invention of the United Nations as a system, it's a great asset for the mankind, for the people of the world. I think that uh, if it will be not uh, delivered or uh, existed, we have to uh, establish that kind of institution. Uh, uh, should we uh, should we work on strengthening opportunity for the, the may, more role of United Nations? But then we're facing the reality that international organizations are consist of member states. And then we're facing with the sovereignty issue, who is first and who is second. And member states, for, for the point of sovereignty, for sure, will not deliver the, uh, uh, the, their sovereignty to the international organizations. And this is probably why uh, when we're talking about UN system and uh, in, even including Security Council, uh, that uh, how to deal with it. When we're talking, for example, for peace enforcement. When I was uh, in New York working there, there was a huge discussion, and it's still going, uh, going on, how far United Nations, including Security Council itself, how far can go in peace enforcement. They can, even with the, with the mandate, each mandate for uh, peacekeeping operations, it's uh, cleverly and particularly uh, discussed and uh, introduced uh, for the ground. But in reality, this is, uh, the, this is the major point. The sovereignty of the state 
and then the role of the uh, United Nations, particularly the Security Council, as you mentioned, as, as a peace builder. So, and whenever they will find it, uh, some equilibrium and uh, more understanding, then probably we can uh, discuss and say about what else can be done for that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Minister. Uh, excellent question. Next, please, introduce yourself. Yes, hello. My name is Pekka Metsu. I'm ambassador at large for peace facilitation coming from Finland. And I have religions as my entry point. Very interesting to hear, Mr. Minister, Rector, the stories of uh, United Nations Security Council. I was there when Finland was the um, rotating member in 8990. And I have to say that when one is old enough, one also starts to see things in more in optimistic light. We have also moved ahead in very many things within the United Nations, dealing a lot with human rights, for example. The Human Rights Council with the U UPR um, methods and all this have brought uh, us much closer together and, and uh, talking to each other in a, in a clearer way. My question, however, would relate because after all these years in diplomacy, I have ended up as a peace facilitator, but especially with the religious angle. Um, what I have seen, of course, there and also within our governments, that we have been completely blind and ignorant about religions. And um, so I would like to hear something from you, how we would like to uh, brighten our sight a little bit of um, my point, of course, is getting also the religious actors on board when we try to get uh, peace mediated. Because without that, I don't think we have a sustainable results as, as we have seen so many times. But religions out of the vacuum, um, uh, to be talked more in the UN, I would be very happy to see your insights into this. Thank you. I'm sorry because I have to leave, but I, I think it's very interesting. I'm going to say something in the closing um, session on uh, we held an academic forum on interreligious uh, dialogue and trying to understand a little bit. The United Nations works quite a bit with faith-based organizations. I think uh, I, will, I will leave the, the hard edge of diplomacy to the minister, but for us, I think this notion of sustainable development requires that we invest on the ground. I think so many of these faith-based organizations are already working to alleviate poverty, to uh, assist with famines and hunger, with natural disasters. It's very important to understand uh, how they come together. Increasingly, there are some excellent models that we could do with scaling up uh, and understanding. We also know what not to do. Uh, I mean, I think how to stay in the institutional realm, not to get into the individual too much, um, and not looking at these as, as clues into themselves. So uh, we will be saying more, but I think it's a whole area of work that the United Nations has been very engaged with, uh, not, not keeping a distance from. I think we do it a little bit under the radar, and, and we try to think that we are learning as we go along. Just answering in short, United Nations is not a religious organization. I can understand what you're saying, that religions uh, can be used uh, for bringing more sustainable peace. Probably it was a lot of confusion because uh, United Nations uh, and the whole system was established uh, uh, when the major actor, one of the major actors was USSR, who was atheists and agnostics, and uh, they do not consider religion as a, as a serious factor in the international relations. But uh, but the building up of configuration and uh, asking the religious leaders uh, all together uh, uh, that uh, they can uh, bring more sustainability and peace, I think that uh, I will agree with you that it's an important issue. I think that one of the major uh, elements that uh, it should be absolutely clear that uh, uh, any conflict which is, exists in the world today uh, cannot and must not be delivered as, uh, as a uh, religious uh, a, a conflict between the different uh, religious faiths. I'm absolutely for sure for that, that uh, because whenever religion is something for the soul, and it cannot be used uh, in uh, the, any aspirations uh, for, the, uh, for the conflict, uh, including majority of the conflict, if you will see, it's again, it's about territories. It's not about religious. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Minister. Refer to religion 
is to incorporate their visions about the different problems. But as said that the minister, the central is how to provide good analysis more than some specific ideology. In that way, the interreligion is a good practice to create a common vision for a common action. Basically, to reinforce the peace education, non-violence, and sustainable peace. I know that there are many questions in the audience, but I want to give the chance to other panelists to come to the floor. Mr. Minister, Mr. Rector, thank you very much for your time, for welcoming remarks, for your insights, for your sharing of experience. We say goodbye to you and we welcome the other panel members. Please come on here. Uh, the, panel, the panel now will be moderated by Ambassador David Puyano. Uh, we invite here now uh, Ambassador Jan Kaustas, Ambassador Hasiev, uh, Professor Rodriguez, and Dr. Al Salama. Hello, hello everyone. Uh, my name is uh, David Fernandez. I'm um, ambassador and the permanent observer of the University for Peace, the United Nations Office and other international organizations in Geneva. Uh, today it's a great, great honor to, uh, to open this uh, high level panel about uh, the strengthening on multilateralism and diplomacy for peace within uh, the UN system. But why we are organizing today this event here? Firstly, uh, because we are celebrating the 100th anniversary of the creation of the, United, of the League of Nations. This was the first global uh, multilateral organization. And secondly, uh, because as the minister said before, uh, last December 2018, the General Assembly adopted a resolution on this specific topic, on multilateralism and diplomacy for peace. And following this event in New York that uh, was convened by the President of the General Assembly last week, uh, we decided uh, with our counterparts, in that case uh, with other university and University for Peace and with uh, all speakers to organize an event on this particular matter. The objective of the panel will be, uh, I mean, will, uh, to discuss about the advantage of the multilateralism and diplomacy for peace and how uh, multilateralism can reinforce the three main pillars of the United Nations, peace and security, human rights and development, and possible actions orientated to introduce the spirit of that resolution within the United Nations. For this occasion, we count with uh, the participation of uh, our panelists. I would like to introduce, I will start from, from right? For, right and after left. We have uh, uh, Her Excellency uh, Dr. 
Abdullah Hamad Absalama, Director General of the Prince Saud Al Faisal Institute for Diplomatic Studies of the Ministry for Foreign Affairs of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. We have Professor uh, Carmen uh, Parra as UNESCO Chair on Peace, Solidarity and Intercultural Dialogue at the University of Abad Oliva, CEU, Barcelona. In the corner, we have uh, Professor Priyankar uh, from UNESCO Chair for Peace and Intercultural Understanding at Banaras. Uh, Hindu University. On my left, I have uh, His Excellency Mr. Kamil uh, Kasiyev, Ambassador and Head of the Department uh, for Regional Security of the Ministry for Foreign Affairs of uh, the Republic of Azerbaijan. Uh, we have uh, His Excellency uh, Ms., uh, Mr. Kestutis uh, Hankauskas, uh, his Ambassador and Head of the European Union Delegation. Uh, to the Republic of Azerbaijan, and in the other corner, we have uh, uh, Dr. Farid Ismaizalde, Vice Rector of the other University. Uh, after the presentation, I would like then to be interactive. I will pose some questions to the, to the panelists. I will please you to spend seven, eight minutes uh, to permit an interactive dialogue. My, my first question goes to the, to the uh, Ambassador of uh, the European Union. Uh, taking into account the three main pillars of the United Nations, and would like to, to ask you what is, uh, from your viewpoint, the connection between peace and human rights, and how, from uh, the European Union, uh, you work on the diplomacy for peace and prevention. Ambassador, you have the floor. Thank you very much. A difficult task to speak after such a distinguished panelist like the minister. Um, but uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here. And I think to all of us, when we say multilateralism, we think of the U UN, but I hope some people also think of the European Union, for the European Union. Uh, it has uh, been our long-standing commitment that we have to the international cooperation, to rules-based international order, with the United Nations and its core, to peace and security, to human rights and sustainable development. We say that because we believe in that. We do it in practice. It works for us. And we want to work with the others to spread those values and the good deeds. For Europe, uh, European Union started as the project of peace after the Second World War. And if you look back, this is the longest period in European history which is peaceful. In 2012, EU has been awarded Nobel Peace Prize for its stabilizing role in transforming most of Europe from the continent of war to the continent of peace. And according to the Norwegian Nobel, Nobel Committee, the EU's most important achievement has been, and I quote, the successful struggle for peace and reconciliation and for democracy and the human rights. Now, what is our secret weapon? I think it's unrivaled way of binding interests of different states so tightly together that uh, war becomes materially impossible. And actually, EU has started from the project of the education, from the project of the College of Europe, because the thought of the fathers of this project was that if people grow together, study together, it is a less chance that they will be fighting each other. For my own country, Lithuania, shortly after we reestablished the independence, we had a very short period of consideration who we are. We immediately opted for EU and European institutions, and we dismissed the notions of being a bridge, something in between, a gray zone, because that's who we felt we are. And today, I'm 15 years after being a member of the European Union. I can proudly say that I am proud to be the European. But that zone of peace and prosperity comes also with responsibilities. 
and um, it's not easy. It's a daily struggle, and it's always the choice between the easy and the right. Um, and we believe that this project of Europe whole and free has not been finished yet. In 2016, European Union adopted our global strategy. And there, we basically believe that we cannot be stable, secure, and developing if our neighbors are not. So we want that zone to be extended, offered also for our neighbors. Neighbors, speaking of Azerbaijan, neighbors in the East, neighbors to European Union, not to Europe. This month, very soon, we will mark the 10th anniversary of the program called Eastern Partnership, where Azerbaijan is one of our partners. Program that is flexible, offering both bilateral and multilateral tracks for the engagement. And I think for all our neighbors, we believe that security, sovereignty, and territorial integrity of all of our partners is equally important to us and to our partners. Europe is consist continuously evolving, adapting. It has meant through many of the transformations. But I think what remains at the core is our belief in the fundamental values. That those fundamental values are the democracy, the human rights, rule of law, market economy, rules-based approach to international trade. And it's not a piecemeal. We believe that you cannot pick and choose, that this is a package of what you believe in, and we do what we believe in, we believe in what we do. What we offer to the others, we offer to work together in these global challenges shrinking world, more globalization, more challenges, to work together because today multilateralism, which is at the core of Azerbaijan's foreign policy, and I would, sorry the minister left, I really wanted to say very skillful foreign policy. Um, I think it is very natural that we would be working together as partners to spread that zone of multilateralism. Um, speaking of um, security and uh, stability, I think European Union also offers a lot of its engagement through diplomacy, through preventive actions, also through military and civilian missions who are all around the world. We have six military, 10 civilian missions with over 5,000 Europeans deployed all around the world. The closest is in the neighboring Georgia, and I had a chance to lead that mission called EU Monitoring Mission. We can talk if there will be questions more about that. Let me conclude by saying that the global challenges like Agenda of 2030 of Sustainable Development, Joint Comprehensive Plan of Actions, Paris Agreement on Climate Change, better functioning of the trade, world trade organizations, and generally multilateralism and rule-based international approach. It's something that we believe in. Uh, we are not trying to impose on the others, but we are offering the others to work together uh, to spread and to sustain these values. Thank you very much. Thank you, Excellency. I, I think uh, you have said the right thing. Uh, the European Union start as a peace project. And, uh, and then uh, now I have uh, the honor and then to, uh, to invite um, uh, uh, Her Excellency, Mr. Camille Hasiyev. Uh, I think uh, I would like to ask you, uh, take into account that uh, you will have the big responsibility <coughs> in, uh, in October uh, to, to lead the non alliance movement what uh, it's uh, composed by, if I don't mistake, 120 countries. Uh, and then what is the, the no, uh, I mean, the, the, the notion of peace and security, no, within this uh, group, no? What, what do you think about this issue? 
Excellency. Uh, thank you very much, uh, and many thanks to the uh, UN University for Peace and Azerbaijan Diplomatic Academy for organizing this important event. It gives me a particular pleasure to know that this event is taking place in, uh, in the world-renowned center of multiculturalism, Baku. So, and uh, in this regard, it's quite symbolic that after the adoption of this important resolution by the United Nations, the first... Uh, in my, uh, as far as I know, um, important event is taking place. Uh, just uh, in my, uh, as far as I know, um, important event is taking place uh, in Baku, which is devoted to multilateralism and diplomacy for peace. Before I start uh, uh, getting into details with regard to our forthcoming chairmanship in the non-aligned movement, I would like just to make uh, some general remarks which I uh, deem relevant in the context of our today's discussion. Uh, uh, there is no doubt that uh, the importance of multilateralism in international relations has increased considerably over the last decade and has no viable alternative for maintenance of international as well as regional peace and security. Uh, the concept of multilateral diplomacy is inseparably linked with international legality and international law. Moreover, multilateralism strengthens the perception of impartiality of diplomacy, both in the affected countries and within a broader international community. Uh, second, the international system with the UN at the center is far from being perfect, we have to acknowledge that, but has no alternative and needs to be improved through increased efficiency. Non-compliance by the UN member states with their obligations under the UN Charter, non-implementation of the resolutions of the General Assembly and even UN Security Council resolutions which are legally binding, represent a major threat to the future of the world order cemented around the United Nations. UN institutions and UN member states should have political will to address non-compliance, at least through diplomatic means. Uh, regional multilateralism or regional arrangements under Chapter 8 of the UN Charter will have to play a more active role in advancing peace and security as well as promoting a peaceful settlement of conflicts in their respective regions. Conflict prevention, crisis management, post-conflict rehabilitation tools will have to be improved. Regional arrangements should develop their own peacekeeping capabilities to be prepared to act when and if mandated by the UN Security Council. Without prejudice to the activities of the uh, UNACR, they should tackle more actively problems of refugees and internally displaced persons, viewing these problems both as consequence of the conflict or crisis and a part of the broader human rights uh, uh, concept, human rights protection concept. Uh, a few words about the OEC in this regard. OEC is a very big regional organization, and as our minister um, uh, has underlined, uh, uh, OEC uh, has been tasked to deal with the conflict settlement, with the settlement of the conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan. OEC is a very big regional organization which unites one fourth uh, UN members. It's in charge of the settlement of the conflict. Uh, between Armenia and Azerbaijan, during which Armenia seized by force 20% of Azerbaijani territory and around 1 million Azerbaijanis were evicted from their homes. Four UN Security Council resolutions are still not implemented. UN three pillars, which, which are outlined in your uh, concept paper, are, uh, uh, they practically coincide with the OEC's comprehensive security concept. However, very often there is a trend to avoid tackling political aspects of security. There is another uh, negative trend in the OEC. 
when problems of IDPs are de facto excluded from consideration in human rights context under the strange pretext of impartiality. Uh, we all understand that international organizations and their member states cannot be impartial to blatant violation of international law. They can, uh, uh, cannot be impartial either to suffering of millions of people. As you have quite correctly pointed out, um, in October, Azerbaijan uh, will, uh, uh, will be the uh, chair of the non-aligned movement. Actually, uh, the non-aligned movement is a very big uh, community of nations which are united with one goal of um, conducting, uh, conducting independent foreign policy and uh, non-alignment with uh, political uh, military alliances. Uh, in fact, uh, the Azerbaijani chairmanship uh, intends, actually, uh, we, we will have uh, two major goals, I think. Uh, the first one is, uh, is obvious, to increase the efficiency of the non-aligned movement. I think that each and every chair in all uh, organizations, when, when they <laughs> start their chairmanship, they, they, they do have uh, such a goal, such an ambitious goal. It's not an easy task. Uh, this uh, non-aligned movement uh, unites uh, 120 countries with, uh, in different parts of the world with different agendas. Uh, but we intend to make use of all uh, necessary instruments, consultative instruments um, uh, within the organization in uh, New York, in Geneva or uh, Addis Ababa. Uh, uh, to make uh, more visible uh, the non-aligned movement in the UN, in the UN General Assembly, maybe in the UN Security Council, maybe in the UN specialized agencies. Uh, of course, uh, it, it is an enormous task, but uh, we, we, we intend uh, to to have uh, consultations with, with all uh, countries in, in the movement, and we uh, uh, think that uh, it's uh, an achievable goal to, to increase the efficiency of, of the non-aligned movement. Uh, and uh, 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 of course, in this regard, we, we would like to, or we, we should also think about uh, uh, possibly, of course, it's, it's also a, a matter of agreement, a matter of uh, political will on the part of the members of the non-aligned movement. We, we should also uh, think about uh, maybe uh, having an enhanced dialogue with uh, regional uh, organizations, um, because membership of uh, many regional organizations uh, coincides actually with, with that of, of the non-aligned movement. And, uh, and of course, uh, our uh, 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 major uh, task, major goal uh, is to, uh, to enhance uh, the implementation of uh, international law, compliance with and implementation of international law. Uh, you know, uh, the minister also referred to that. Uh, there are Bandung principles which uh, underlie actually uh, the work of this uh, organization, uh, this movement, non-aligned movement, which uh, uh, actually these uh, Bandung principles uh, have been guiding the non-aligned movement for, for the last um, six years or, or so. Uh, and uh, of course these Bandung uh, principles are inseparably linked with the UN Charter. So uh, we have to translate principles into reality. We have uh, to make them work. And that's uh, another, another general task that um, our chairmanship has, uh, has uh, to face um, uh, during our chairmanship. I I'll stop here and I'll be pleased to take your questions. Thank you. Thank you, excellent. Uh, thank you, Excellency. I think I would like to highlight this issue no, about the relationship between, uh, as you say, 
between multilateralism and uh, international law. No? And this point uh, gives us to the to the main no the, the main uh, treaty that we have is the UN Charter. Now uh, I'm going to my right side, and then uh, as we say before, uh, one of the main pillars of the United Nations is uh, development. In this sense, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Al Salama to uh, to uh, to discuss about uh, how how the trade no, and growth in economy can improve uh, the conditions of social and international peace. And then uh, and then uh, I would like to add another question that I mean you have some example on uh, diplomacy for peace applied by the uh, IDS, no, the the Institute uh, for Diplomatic Studies. Excellency, the floor is yours. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's really a great opportunity, and I would like, first of all, to thank His Excellency, the President of Azerbaijan, uh, Mr. Ilham Alif, and his government as well, and the people who organize and work hardly in order to gather us together t today. Uh, and uh, as you mentioned, and some of our colleagues before, uh, there is a uh, uh, a correlation bet between the trade and the growth. We cannot isolate uh, them uh, um, uh, because if we uh, have a look over, uh, quick overlooking about the level of the growth on the world, we can see, for example, in Asia and especially East Asia, and the uh, new emerging economy as well in this area or around this area. Uh, they have a high uh, level of growth, which create more prosperity and let the people engage more with their social life in a peaceful situation, and they minimize the conflict and the problem within the hostile within their economy. Uh, in Comparative, if we take, for example, what happened in some part of Africa, and we can find the level of growth is, is a minimum, and it's also affected negatively by the security in, uh, uh, inside the country. What, wherever we find instability, we find a negative impact in economy. There is no single economy in the world can achieve any improvement unless there is uh, stability and peace within the country. Uh, this peace also could be affected either uh, from outside of the country itself or inside when we can just monitor what happened in some, we call them um, uh, Arabian, we call, we call it Arabian Spring, what happened to in, in, in Syria or in Libya or in also other parts in, in uh, the Arab world. Uh, this creates disaster now. We can just see the situation which is now going into worse and there is an uh, influxity of refugees around the world. This also affect the whole economy and then there will be no more trade in order to exchange with the other world in, in, in the world, with the other country in the world. Uh, in this respect, for example, if we go to China, the level of growth around now 5.5%, India almost 7% because there is uh, uh, peace and the government control and the people just concentrate in, in, in their education, their the, the health infrastructure to be improved. Otherwise, uh, the situation will be uh, worse. Who uh, out of uh, us can imagine India with no prosperity, with no, with no, for example, uh, uh, peace, a huge country with more than one uh, billion inhabitant, and also is uh, a great local demand. Now, if there is any uh, disruption outside the country, they can even move their goods and services, and they have it inside, and uh, they will they also will have more saving uh, to generate more business and more job opportunity to eliminate the level of unemployment. Uh, any country has an objective for its economy uh, uh, to be developed uh, through the industrial, mainly, or th through uh, agriculture, or the, through services sector. These sectors will not be in better shape if there is no around 
not environmental to growth. For example, uh, um, now we can see some country which move for the last year, uh, uh, 10 years, in, in very fascinating situation, like what happened now in, in uh, South Korea. Now, they, their technology in our hand, wherever we, we go, also they, they are uh, now uh, facing tremendous growth, and which help the people to, uh, uh, to improve their lifestyle. I still remember in my country, uh, so many Korean companies uh, used to operate in Saudi Arabia during that time, and uh, built infrastructure. When we visit last time, we met their prime minister, and he said, no, we cannot go anymore to any uh, uh, Middle Eastern country or any country in the world in order to build infrastructure, we can give you our experience, our intelligence in, in terms of economics in order to develop, but we cannot go to materialize the situation there within the uh, country. Uh, also, it is uh, very important to think about the youth in some developing country now. Some country like, my, like Saudi Arabia, more than 50% of, uh, of the population is uh, uh, under 50 years, and they, they need uh, a job opportunity. There is no way to provide a job. At least we have more export, more trade, uh, more engagement with the outside world, and also uh, uh, to create uh, with, with uh, another country a good um, atmosphere, atmosphere in order to uh, uh, grow the economy. Uh, if we take, for example, the, uh, uh, our uh, an Institute of Diplomatic Studies and its role uh, to uh, enhance the peace. Uh, we, uh, I just would like to summarize the goal of the Institute, which is Prince Saud al Faisal Institute of Diplomatic Studies. Uh, you, everybody of us knows who is Prince Saud al Faisal. He is the great foreign minister for almost 40 years. Therefore, the name of the diplomacy come after his name. We have two main goals. One, to, to train Saudi diplomats in order to enhance their capability to match the needs of uh, uh, surfing um, abroad, surfing Saudi embassies and also in uh, international organization in order to be uh, uh, qualified to deal with uh, the, the needs for working abroad. Uh, and we have more than 75 training s special courses designed for them in order to meet the demand. Also, we help another uh, uh, country, friend country, especially for the low def developed country from Africa, from another part of the world, to train their youth in order to enhance their training capability. Uh, last year, we trained more than 10 uh, uh, nationals. I don't want to specify because they could be something uh, understandable in a wrong way. But uh, we are proud of this relation also with the, the people. Also, we have uh, four um, uh, center, which is strategic center, study center. We have the strate uh, strategic center, European center, Asian, and American one. All this center uh, uh, work as a think tank center, and we enhance our relationship with a, a, a think tank and semi-organization uh, uh, for these centers in order to have communication and better understand and create also a, a good environmental for uh, peace and uh, understanding each another. When there is a conflict and when there is misunderstanding about Saudi policy, they, they come visit us and we discuss. We uh, follow the Chatham House role and we ask them to talk openly. There is no, no restriction. Even Minister of Foreign Affairs cannot control us and say what we are going to talk about it. We have to have freedom if we need to understand each another. They speak openly. And now, uh, nowadays, there is uh, even uh, uh, a great nation in, uh, like Germany, another uh, uh, famous nation around the world, they take the advice from the uh, special center, which is think tank center, because sometimes they could not have the caliber people to understand and the atmosphere or, or to understand the foreign policy of the other nations. Therefore, if they, they come to us and we discuss, they may understand some point we should not let them to change their mind. Nobody can change the mind of the other, but we can let them understand why we are thinking as a Saudi society, as a Saudi, I mean, 
people uh, also uh, professors and, and, and well educated what we think about certain uh, international uh, uh, I mean problem or issue in international arena I don't want to take long time because maybe uh, the other is waiting hopefully I didn't consume so many time thank you very much for giving me the opportunity thank you uh, thank you excellency I think uh, you have provided us a very interesting formula magic formula to uh, to promote diplomacy for peace it can be resuming four words stability peace growth and prosperity now I'm going to to my left side uh, it's an honor then to to invite uh, dr. Farid uh, is my salde vice rector of uh, Ada University and then I would like to, in this in this way no do you have uh, uh, examples no how yes. you did Ada, <coughs> no? promote diplomacy for peace thank you I will be very brief because our panel is already quite late but I think as a person who represents educational institution I am a firm believe, firm believer in the power of education uh, if we want to eradicate extremism radicalism terrorism if we want to create mutual understanding then the best way to do is to invest in power of youth in education of youth and as my uh, colleague from Saudi Arabia mentioned most of our countries uh, have uh, a large proportion of youth in our societies, uh, some of these youths have no access to education, some of them no access to opportunities, to businesses. Um, the ambassador of EU has mentioned a great example of EU as a successful multilateral platform. We can, I think, borrow some of the examples from EU uh, when it comes to education, when it comes to youth empowerment, mobility, and apply it in other regions of the world. For example, exchange of students. Uh, so many European universities are doing exchange of students, they are doing mobility programs, short-term visiting programs. This creates mutual understanding, this creates cult re reduces cultural barriers, people get to know each other. We should replicate these models in other parts of the world as well, in Middle East, in Asia. It will be very helpful. We should create scholarship opportunities for young people to study. Uh, our university is granting 30 scholarships per year to uh, students from developing countries, uh, from non-aligned movement, from organization of Islamic country in member states. We should increase this number of scholarships. When young people come and study, get good quality education, they are less inclined to do uh, bad things in the world and they are more inclined to do good things. We should do more programs on religious understanding. And I like the question from our Finnish colleague because uh, we should consider religious factor in our educational programs. What we do at our university is we take students to different religious institutions, we take them to different religious places so that they get exposure and they learn different cultures, different religions, different perspectives. This is very important so that we don't educate people in the same nationalistic way or within the same nationalistic boundaries. We should open their minds and uh, we should do it with different religions, different ethnic groups. We should create discussions at universities where different perspectives are heard. This would be, it could be extremely useful. Uh, we should focus on young people we should educate them, provide them with quality education. We should give them with broader platform for dialogue, for understanding, for discussions, op with access to open media. And this could create foundations for more sustainable peace in the future. I will stop here because I don't want to take more time. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor. I think you have been going to the, to the point. Uh, it's the education. This education is, is the better way then to, uh, to fight against terrorism, uh, radicalization, and extremism. And then uh, I'm going now to my right side. Uh, we are going to, uh, to talk with uh, uh, another professor from another part of uh, the world, from Spain. And then uh, in, that, in this sense, uh, uh, the UNESCO chair on, on, on peace, uh, intercultural dialogue. And then you have some examples, no? Because this is this is what we want then to show to the to the to the audience, no? Examples of diplomacy for peace, no? Can you provide us, please? Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Fernandez. And I want uh, to send the organization at the government of Azerbaijan to let me explain the role of the universities in the multilateralism and diplomacy for peace. Uh, the, your question, what is the, the role of the university, the good practice of the university in this uh, field? Um, we have a tool, uh, it's an UNESCO chair named 
peace, uh, solidarity and intercultural dialogue that allow us uh, an space uh, to work. An example of this collaboration was born uh, in the context of the 70th anniversary of the United Nations and UNESCO, signing its inspection a global uh, assessment on progress and challenge of the peace agenda uh, was made. The third peace, solidarity, and intercultural dialogue was honored to create a partnership with the UNESCO liaison office in Geneva in order uh, to make a research on the notion of peace within the different entities of uh, the um, of the United Nations. Uh, in this case, uh, with the uh, research, we wanted to foster the knowledge and the understand, understanding on the rapprochement of culture uh, to promote of human rights. In this line, research worked with the purpose of analyzing the added value of peace as a first pillar of the United Nations and one of the main objectives of UNESCO. Additionally, uh, this research made a mapping and comparative study about 32 United Nations entities which have uh, included the promotion of peace as some fundamental goal uh, to the uh, professionally implemented and a measure uh, to prevent conflict in this war and to overcome post-crisis situation. It has been first time that an entity, in this case, in this case a university, uh, has asked the bodies of the United Nations for their work, um, for um, work for the peace, signing its uh, creation. Uh, to make this work, uh, the three private meetings held between uh, 2016 and 2017. One in Barcelona, in the University of Atolibaceu, my university, and uh, other one in uh, Geneva, in the seat of the United Nations, and another in the United Nations in New York. Uh, in these meetings, uh, 32 uh, selected representatives of the United Nations entities, international organizations, uh, and mandate holders, uh, deeply analyzed the relationship between peace sec and security, human rights and development. The difference uh, between the negative and positive peace and the role played by the uh, bodies of the United Nations was careful study in the light of the Charter of the United Nations, the International Human Rights and Peace Instruments. In particular, this global reflection was taking into account the main pace law adopted by the General Assembly. of uh, the research and on consultation with United Nations entities has been included in a book uh, that um, before Ms. Um, Nada uh, Al-Nashid uh, had referred in the speech, uh, the, book of the, uh, the, the title of the book is Long Walk of Peace Toward a Culture of, of Prevention. It's a book uh, translated uh, to English, uh, French, and soon in Spanish, and is the result of all this uh, research. It has been distributed free of charge in different research centers, academic institutions, permanent mission, and civil society organizations, and national institutions. The other hand, uh, and uh, with this example, I want to explain uh, the work of the chair and the university uh, through three pillars. The first pillar is the training because in our hands um, are future politicians, economists, journalists, lawyers, who must work for peace. 
it is therefore very important that they know at the university values uh, the human right uh, instrument and their, and their respect. For this, we organize uh, courses, seminar, workshop, and uh, we are introducing the curriculum interdisciplinary subject based on human rights and currently on the sustainable development goals. Our students also carry out internship in international organizations so that they know the importance of multilateralism in the development of the economy, politics, or culture. Uh, the second pillar is the research. The university is a space of knowledge and reflection. When outside of political interest, it is possible to investigate and ana to analyze the three uh, founding pillars of the United Nations to take an uh, important challenge. In fact, the notion of, of peace as a first pillar is fundamental uh, to create the basis of a more harmonious world. In this sense, it is important not to work alone. Uh, the collaboration between universities and international entities, NGOs, or representation of civil society is essential to, uh, to obtain useful results. The example on um, our collaboration with UNESCO should be followed by the academic work to obtain studies and research that we help um, the promotion of peace uh, worldwide through education, science and culture. Our collaboration too with the University for Peace is very important for our students to know a global space of work. The third pillar is diffusion. This is important to debulk the culture of peace beyond the academic work. For that reason, uh, the congresses, forums, conferences are organized by the university. On the other hand, the participation of academic writing paper that later will be published in a specialized magazine help to spread this message. As an example of good practices in a university, in this uh, sense, uh, uh, was uh, created in a review, uh, created in, in our university, titled The Yearbook of Diplomatic and Consular Law. This is a um, review, a specialized review in three languages, English, uh, French, and Spanish, where academics, uh, diplomatists, and experts in consular law write about the multilateralism and the importance of, diplomat of diplomacy to have a war in peace. I encourage collaboration and networking between other academics and other entities to boost and war support in peace. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Carmen. I think uh, she went to the point, no, to the issue of the, the importance of research, research, and then this uh, great, no, I mean, book that I mean UNESCO and the University uh, the of Abat Oliva has published. And then before going to the, because now we are going a little out of time, going to uh, to the concluding remarks by Professor. Priyanka from uh, Banaras Hindu University. Somebody in the in the floor wants to uh, pose uh, some questions to the our panelists. Uh, it's a great opportunity if you want to raise some issue, uh, or maybe you, uh, uh, or distinguished panelists, you want then to to react to some uh, of the comments made by your colleagues. The floor is open. Somebody wants. To... No. Okay. Nobody wants then? Cool. Ah, okay, so, sorry. Yes, please, uh, can you introduce by yourself and then? Um, thank you very much. My name is Lara Huerinos. I'm from the Republic of Ghana. Uh, my question is to the representative from the government of Azerbaijan and then the gentleman, uh, I'm sorry, I missed your name, <laughs> from Saudi, the Saudi Arabia. Yes.
security and then development. And then in the absence of that, we tend to shed a little more light, uh, less light on human rights. Now I take it uh, based on what you mentioned on the ambassador from Finland said. Yes, indeed, we have come a long way. Indeed, we have come a long way, but we tend to realize more that the moment you have peace, security, and development, we tend to shed a less light on human rights. I want to know what you're doing for human rights, to, to make people conscious of, of human rights, and what you're doing in, in your institutions to make sure that the concept of human rights transcends to the very basic, I mean, to the, to the, to the mere person on, on the street. Thank you so much. Thank you for your uh, for your excellent question. As you say, it's uh, this is, is one of the pillars, no, of the uh, United Nations and the UN Charter. And then uh, uh, I don't know who, who wants then to take the floor. Maybe you first, Excellency. Well, thank you very much, and uh, thank you uh, for, for this question. You know, uh, Azerbaijan uh, uh, attaches great importance to implementation of inter its uh, commitments, um, international commitments, including uh, those related to, to the protection of human rights. We are members uh, of the Council of Europe. We acceded to all conventions, but uh, what, what needs to be understood is that uh, that's a conscious choice uh, of the Azerbaijani people, protection of human rights and democracy. And what we do, uh, we do not uh, because of international organizations. I, I, I have to speak about international organizations and uh, international dimension of that, because I come from the foreign ministry, apparently. <laughs> but uh, uh, this, is, uh, this is what we do. And uh, um, uh, of course, uh, you know, uh, there are uh, certain uh, issues. I, I fully subscribe to what you, you have said uh, with regard to, uh, to sustainable development, uh, human rights. Uh, Azerbaijan uh, is a country which uh, actually has been facing uh, problems related to foreign military occupation and uh, emergence of a big number of refugees and internally displaced persons. Uh, you know what our uh, society, what our government is doing. Um, actually, uh, we, uh, on, uh, we had only 750,000 IDPs and uh, approximately 250,000 refugees. Uh, uh, you know, I, uh, when I joined the foreign ministry uh, some 26 years ago, uh, the war was going on, um, um, so, so there were a lot of um, uh, internally displaced persons everywhere, and I, I was accompanying uh, foreign delegations actually to, uh, to the areas, to, to the camps, refugee camps, uh, which were set up throughout uh, the whole country. Um, you know, um, uh, practically each and every uh, family in Azerbaijan um, was affected by this um, uh, serious IDP crisis. Even uh, my family was affected, the family of my, my, my wife, they, they, they are from Zangilan region, uh, uh, which, uh, which is under Armenian occupation. Uh, and. Uh, 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 therefore, uh, uh, at the level of the Azerbaijani government, we paid particular attention to the problem, to the human rights of internally displaced persons. And this is quite, quite understandable, and uh, I, I spoke about that. Uh, uh, so I, I will stop here, and uh, thank you. Before going the, the floor to His Excellency, I think it's important to remember in 2006, uh, I mean, the General Assembly adopted a resolution creating the Human Rights Council, and we passed from the Human Rights uh, Commission to the Human Rights Council, <laughs> and create a system is the Universal Periodical Review, in which all the member states subscribe and they pass the review, no? All, and then it's a way no, to uh, promote human rights through two main principles that are based in the UN Chapter, the principle of cooperation and the principle of dialogue. No? Uh, this, I wanted then to you know it's, it's an important issue then to take into account no the, the issue of uh, um, cooperation no please uh, Excellency uh, I don't want to take long time because we're already uh, a little bit late 
with respect to uh, the United Nations, Saudi Arabia, one of the first country, uh, I mean, one of the country who uh, uh, founded the United Nations, we can find it in, in from uh, 1945. But uh, also with respect to what we are teaching in our institute, we uh, have been uh, really actively uh, um, uh, training uh, the human rights in, in, in uh, various subjects in our institute and uh, enlightening the, the rights of, the, of, of, of and, uh, and the international law in order to practice up on that. Uh, uh, we are not, for example, in, in, uh, working on, on behalf of another organization. We are just a training and, and uh, academic center in order to uh, highlight these things. Also, through the think tank discussion, we try to enlighten the, the, the rights of the people. Uh, however, there is also, uh, if, if you have, if you are facing, if you are in a developing country and you are uh, facing, you know, uh, outside uh, country who is intervening in, in uh, internal matters like what we are facing in from Iran. Our Iran is our neighbor. For uh, when the Iranian Revolution started in 1979, we began to face also problem regarding to some issue, and they try to say this is the uh, evaluating, for example, the human rights. But there is also intervention within our internal aspect in Saudi Arabia. This one, I mean, we should not just. Um, take this one as a fact and they said that we, we, we have a problem because in, in this respect or in, or in this activity because some of it is propaganda and we are based on Islamic religion. Islamic religion is guaranteed the right of the people for the life, for the speech, and for also uh, uh, practice their right in the life. Um, we are uh, really uh, aware of that. It is very important. And uh, we are uh, like any other uh, country in the world. Uh, ha we may f f f f face uh, critical uh, coming from outside and, and or, or from also international organization. But the country is improving. The situation is improving within time. Our country is open, our uh, also responsible uh, uh, people is open to talk, and I think there is nothing that we should hide. Thank you very much, Excellency, for, for um, all of all the speakers. Uh, now we are at the end. I would like then to, uh, to give I mean, the floor to uh, uh, Professor Priyankar to make uh, some concluding remarks. Uh, you are, Excellency, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, uh, David, and uh, I think it goes without saying that uh, uh, we have covered a lot of grounds and uh, very innovative ideas in, on the board, but time is virtually run out of time. I'll be very quick. First of all, compliments to ADA and the University of Peace uh, for bringing together this uh, session. Uh, it's, it's very uh, significant simply because the, the United Nations has uh, decided to have 24th of April uh, being uh, celebrated, being commemorated as the International Day for, uh, you know, multilateral, uh, multilateralism and diplomacy for peace. And just seven days after we are sharing, we are ventilating uh, what we feel about it. Now, one has to really start with why suddenly this International Day was proclaimed. There is a very strong urgency, I think, within the United Nations and outside, throughout the world, throughout the planet. There is a feeling that multilateralism and peace diplomacy, which is so pivotal to human existence, is somehow uh, not getting the kind of attention, not getting that kind of salience that it should get. The other way around, it is on decline, some kind of uh, as the Secretary General said in, uh, very sharply that the multilateralism is in fire. And this is happening at a time when perhaps this planet Earth, we need multilateralism and diplomacy of peace far more than any other time in previous history. It's too much of an interconnected world. The problem anywhere, at any part of any continent, soon becomes a problem for all of us. There are so many issues that transcend borders. There are problematic areas like terrorism. There are severe threats of uh, 
health epidemic that travel fast. We need a global approach. Long we know about the global commons, for instance. But this is a time when, as the Secretary General says, the uh, multilateral spirit, multilateralism is in fire. And anybody can see it, that this is something that nobody anticipated. And I think in the, this session and earlier also in the, the prefacing session, uh, the certain issues have come up. And I would like just to mention them and then we'll build a certain context to conclude. Now, one thing that has uh, come out very sharply is that globally there is a rise of populism. And this popular kind of politics thrives on parochial identities. Leaders after leaders, they make it a point to say that nation first. I mean, nation was always the top priority. But I think that it's meaningful to say when they say their country first, there is an argument that we don't care much about the outside of our multilateral commitments. There is also this trust deficit, this trust deficit uh, within the nation states itself. The people don't trust their governments. So the governments have to make inflated promises of prob probably that sometimes do not coincide with their multilateral commitments. There is trust deficit about the international institutions, most of the institutions. I mean, we have worked together on this book, and uh, it was a long three years effort that we compiled it. And, you know, I, in fact, the, uh, the, the first part was done by me and David and Carmen, they helped in. It's, it's a composite effort. We talked to the entities, we talked to everybody, and there was this gnawing feeling that the entities feel that they are, their work is not appreciated as much as probably their real efforts were. So there's a trust deficit. People do not trust that United Nations can deliver. And it is reflecting in the policies of the so-called great powers and not so great powers. When, when did it all become? When did it all came in so sharply? I think it all began with the uh, global financial crisis of the recent past, let's say a decade ago, when suddenly it led to, it unleashed upheavals in many domestic societies. There were issues, unresolved issues of refugee and migration that still threatened, more threatened the, you know, as we call it, the security anxieties of people. And also above all, and I think this is a question that we need to really think very hard about it, is the unfulfilled promises of globalization. I mean, through this interconnectivity, interconnected world and globalization has provided dividends. It has sped up the pace of global commerce, et cetera, et cetera. But it has not benefited the majority of the people. I mean, sometimes in my part of the world, and I come from India, they say it's a globalization of misery. The rich people have become richer, but look at the poor people, and their numbers are on rise. I don't have to quote data the number of people living in extreme poverty has risen in a remarkable manner, and so is the number of people who are struck by hunger. It's still an unresolved uh, problem. So therefore, you know, this existentialist anxiety has led to the emergence of a leadership throughout, and we see this is a pattern, where leaders do not feel important to talk about the United Nations, the multilateral agencies, and so on and so forth. Now, therefore, I mean, today I was so delighted to hear about the non-aligned movement, and I was so I'm happy that it goes to Azerbaijan and coming to Baku process. This is my third time virtually. I mean, two time present, one time I was here through the Skype. I feel that, and, I, and I'm one of those who worked on non-alignment as my doctoral thesis, and I know the great hopes were hyped at that point. This was an organization which said that we will do it together not in a singular profession. But look at, it's in disarray, and I hope that this time on, probably uh, the, the minister is there, the responsible people are there, and we'll be here to watch do it, because we have great hopes. Now, non-alignment has declined. But you see, the, there are also problems. There have been problems with the kind of multilateralism we had and the kind of uh, diplom diplomacy of peace we were conducting. And the problem was that whether take it or not, it was still, it became a close preserve of the so-called powerful countries. And there was a resentment. And now with the rise of China, 
India, Brazil, these countries are claiming their space in the international organization, and so are other countries. So the systems that kind of pretended to be multilateral were actually not entirely controlled by the uh, the, the, by everybody. I mean, this whole issue of democratization of international relations was more of a chimera rather than anything. But then, you know, the good practices have happened. You know, there's, there's, there's certain things that we need to reckon with. One is, of course, this Paris uh, Agreement on Climate Change. This is the first time we saw a multilateral agreement, which was a comp compilation of nationally determined frameworks. It was a networked arrangement. It was a disaggregated uh, approach and it was a bottoms-up approach. So multilateralism remains important and shall remain important. The probably the only thing we need to do is to think hard on how to really bring everybody in, not only the states and the leaders, but also the people and uh, people of this planet Earth. Finally, about education. Well, education is for transformation. I mean, I always ask this question that how is it that leaders can be so parochial and can be so kind of uh, chauvinistic, I'm not naming any particular country as such. And then it comes to me that among other things, there is also this feeling that public constituency is innocent. We have to make public constituencies, the people more aware, more conscious about the pragmatism of multilateralism, about the pragmatism of peace, as somebody said. If people understand that Peace, a peaceful neighbor, for instance, in, in, in a neighboring country, if the people understand that peace is pragmatic, it's essential, it's vital for them, they cannot live in peace just by making their neighbors unhappy, then perhaps that will be a, a good beginning for uh, the kind of uh, ideas that we are talking about. End of the day, I'll tell you, I mean, we are academic and we are sometimes utopian, euphoric also, but I believe that essentially it is about human nature. I remember recently we did a very good work together on uh, you know, the so-called indigenous approaches to peace building and this Ubuntu is an idea, is an approach that comes from Africa. Probably it's not as popular because it doesn't come from the, the so-called popular uh, uh, you know, knowledge systems. What is this Ubuntu idea? It's very simple. Unless everybody is not happy around, you cannot remain happy. So you have to make every, everybody be included in your thought, in your practice. And I think these are the things in India, and I wanted not to mention because there's so much of ideas, we are so rich in ideas, and uh, at times in practice also, but Gandhi was there. But there was this concept, which is a still, which resonates in our political circles and leaders and everybody talks, was Sudhaev Kutumbakam, the whole planet is a family. There are global commons that you cannot ignore. And I'll tell you that basically there is no contradiction between nationalism and internationalism. But we ha how do you bring these ideas there? You have to sell these ideas. And religion, very, very important. I think long time we have ignored religion as if it's irrational. But interreligious understanding, intercultural understanding, multicultural literacy, I think that's very fundamental thing that even United Nations, United Nations is doing things. We are, our chairs have this interreligious component and we had a very good practical session just the day before. But I think multicultural literacy is very important. Today's world, religion and faith is not going away. So what you do, tell your students, tell ourselves about the good things of other religion. And more importantly, people should also know better about their own religions. At times, we pretend that we know more about other people's religion, but the fact is that we don't know enough about our own religion. So all these ideas, thank you very much for this wonderful session. Very, uh, what should I say, insightful, very practical ideas also, I should say. And um, I hope that uh, this session, which I think uh, will be the first of its kind since 24th April, is the first time, seven days after, We'll keep on having many more sessions like this. Thank you very much, each one of you, for being patient. Thank you, everybody. Uh, I think we are out of time. Uh, it's time to lunch. And then thank you very much for your attendance. Thank you, the panelists. Thank you, all of you. And, and see you soon. Bye-bye.